the cord. That's what I did. So this is not a good time to swear at somebody. Gonna join us. Stephanie didn't beat you up, and you know, if you didn't beat him up. He's still sinning. He's like, oh, he did. Good. Ah, okay. Hello. I'm still. There we go. Yeah, we should really update that picture. Okay, ready to get started? Uh, my name is Mark Michaelis, and today we're going to be talking about PowerShell. Um, uh, so to start, how many of you have you know familiar with PowerShell and know how to more than just how to spell it? Yeah, a few people. Yeah. Okay, how many of you people? Uh, could actually go ahead and write a PowerShell function in what they would consider correctly. <laughs> and how many of you people are ready to write a book or have written a book on PowerShell? Okay, we got. <laughs> okay, um, this is an introductory talk. So if you're really, um, you know, an expert at PowerShell, that's great. My goal is to teach you one thing. If I only teach you one thing, but if I don't teach you anything. Then at the end, we're going to take a poll. You're going to be signed up for speaking next. So that's the goal. I don't teach you anything. Therefore, you're an expert. And you do the next talk, which is not going to be advanced, but you know, intermediate PowerShell. And if you don't learn anything in the intermediate PowerShell talk, because you know everything, then you're going to do the following talk, which is the expert PowerShell. So I got the easy one. I got the beginning, the beginning talk here. So that's, that's where we're going to start. Um, a bunch of topics, just sort of an overview of what we're going to talk. But I'm going to try sort of take questions and adjust as I hear what you guys have to say. Uh, but for the most part, we're going to do an introduction, sort of understand how to get into PowerShell, learn PowerShell to start. Um, we'll do a little bit about working with collections. So essentially, how do you do link with PowerShell? We'll talk a little bit about that, that uh, early on. Uh, I want to show you some stuff for writing PowerShell uh, providers, which is something most people are not familiar with, but you're actually all using it. If you've ever got into PowerShell, you probably used a provider and didn't realize it. And then we'll go into some other kinds of stuff that, that leads to that. And I think that's it. So uh, before we start, anything, I have to learn this. Like there's any questions that if we don't make sure you learn this, then we're not going to meet expectations related to PowerShell. Just so we clarify the scope of that question. Related to PowerShell, any questions that you guys want to make sure I cover uh, in this introductory talk? What is PowerShell? Great, good question. OK, we'll start with that one. What are the other questions? that you guys want to make sure I cover. Ah, great question. So if I'm going to go work with PowerShell, what is the PowerShell editor uh, of choice, not only for the terminal, but also for editing PowerShell files? Great question. I think we can cover that one right at the beginning as well. Other questions related to PowerShell? Anything else we got to talk, talk about commands. So we gotta, we're going to cover all of them. Yeah, OK, we'll make sure we cover every single command Available in PowerShell, including the ones we haven't written yet. Yep, we'll cover that too. Okay, good. Uh, any other any other things about PowerShell that you want to cover? There, there's a great question. Over command line, are we talking like which command line? DOS. Okay. So so Josh would like to know why uh, PowerShell is more important than than DOS. So that will it's a low bar there. We can probably cover that one. That's pretty good. Kevin. When you can pass out first to C sharp. Okay, 
So I think that's a great set of questions for the introduction part of this talk. So let's start, first of all, and, and just sort of say, what is PowerShell? So first of all, PowerShell is a command line uh, that you, a command line shell, uh, so CLI, if you like, uh, and allows you to go ahead and use .NET on the command line. So uh, that, that's sort of the first thing to sort of understand. If you are familiar with .NET, you now get to work with .NET and use it on the command line. And that itself is really powerful for .NET developers. Um, the most important characteristic that I like to talk about PowerShell and what makes it fairly unique amongst almost all uh, command lines out there is that when you work with PowerShell, you're actually working with objects and they're .NET objects. And the reason why this is interesting is normally when you go type some text, um, you know, we'll just say, uh, hello, my, my name is Nigo. And you pipe that across to the other side. Uh, inevitably, when you do that, in most shells, you're going to be passing text. So you're going to have some kind of interpreter on the other side, and you're going to go do something with the text that comes across the wire. And inevitably, when you do that, you're going to have to work with text and go ahead and parse that text and then translate that data coming across the wire into to go ahead and use it. So what's unique about working with PowerShell is the, the, the data coming across that pipe is actually an object. It's a .NET object always. And so instead of saying, OK, well, let me take that text and say, well, which part of that phrase as the name or something like that, I can actually use that as a string. I'll explain the syntax in a little bit, but I can go do it, use that as a string. And because it's a .NET object, I have a whole bunch of members that are available to me as part of working with that object. So I can do things like you would expect. I can go do things like get type. Uh, because it's a .NET object, every .NET object uh, supports the get type uh, method. And so you can go ahead and call get type in it. And if I go do that and hit enter, you'll notice it comes back and says, hey, the data type you're working with is a string because we said everything within the command line is, is an object. I can do something similar. So for example, we could go ahead and take an int, or we could take a series of ints. We could pipe those across, and we can go ahead and do the similar kind of command. Again, I'll explain the syntax shortly, but dollar underscore dot. And now I can see what are the available things to me when I'm working with whatever's coming across the pipe. Um, and we'll go ahead and do a dot new type on this one too. We'll see. It may, it may be interpreted as a string. Ah, good. So on the top right there, I, I have the hotkeys showing up. Yeah, so you can actually see what I'm typing. In this case, uh, I did a, I have no idea. My, my fingers know, but I don't know what to type. So I did a dot, a dot, control space. We'll go ahead and pop up the different members that are available to run that member. And then you can just use the arrow keys to cycle through them. And you can use tab to select. And then enter when you're done. And then I can go ahead and enter again and, and go do that. And it's going to come across. And so it's telling me, hey, what I'm getting back in this case is an int32 because I passed in a .NET object. So I can now work with the .NET object on the other side. Um, this, this factor alone, the fact that what goes across the pipe is a .NET object, is what I think makes PowerShell deserve to have the word power in the front of the word shell. It was what makes PowerShell powerful. Uh, and I think it's the most important characteristic and is somewhat unique against, against predominant, sort of predominant command line interpreters that are out there. Uh, that, that's a really unique, unique characteristic. Uh, and at what is an additional feature about it is that it's cross-plat. So you can now install PowerShell on you know, Windows, Do, uh, <laughs> Windows, I was say DOS. <laughs> Windows, Linux, Mac, it, it works in all those shells. And so that allows me to go ahead and write scripts that are portable to any platform that I'm working with. And it gives me a very easy way to go ahead and explore, explore that. So that's, that's uh, sort of the introduction to why I think PowerShell is important, is it can be used cross-platform and across the pipe when you can go ahead and work and interact with objects. And that's, uh, and that's, and that's key and that's most important. Um, in addition, we're just using uh, literals that we're typing on the command line. So I'm typing 1 through 10, or I can go and type a string. But we can go ahead and instantiate objects coming out of .NET libraries. I can go ahead and load in assemblies and then work with objects that are part of, uh, that are part of .NET, but maybe not you know, inherent to the shell. So you can extend it in an unlimited way to any .NET library that can load it, be loaded into the shell. And you can do remoting and interact with objects remotely. All of that stuff is, is stuff that's very powerful. Um, OK, so I think that was one of the first questions we got. Nicole said, hey, what, you know, what is the deal with PowerShell? And why should we bother to spend an hour 
I were talking about it. Um, another question was, okay, so I've heard of this thing, this thing called ISD, and I know there's a bunch of other ways to interact with PowerShell. Give me some idea of what the editor that I, of choice would, would be preferable. So the reason I bring this up is back in Windows uh, Pass, I don't know if you're familiar with that one, but there's one called Windows Pass, and, and inside there, Windows Pass, there was a PowerShell called uh, Windows PowerShell ISD. There was this great edit, editor custom built for PowerShell that allows you to go ahead and edit and work with files uh, and have a command line at the bottom. And then at the top, you had sort of help on the right here. Uh, and you can also go ahead and work with, with commands at the top and interact with the editor as well. And it turns out that this is no longer supported going forward. You can still use it. It's still built into Windows, uh, but it's not the preferred mechanism of choice because it turns out there's now a cross-platform editor that we were all familiar with called Cold Code. And so now with code, you can go ahead and start interacting with PowerShell, and it's a lot easier for you to go ahead, if you're going to be writing scripts, is to just do that inside code. And there's a bunch of editors. It's not great. It's still got some work to do. It's all open source. Uh, but by far, that's, the, that's the, 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 the IDE of choice if you're going to start writing, writing, writing PowerShell and interacting with PowerShell. Um, OK. Uh, so, so one of the questions that I asked right at the beginning was why would you prefer PowerShell over uh, another kind of command line? And again, it goes back to the fact that across the pipe, we're going to go ahead and pass an object. And, and that, that's fairly unique not to have to just work with strings and text coming across the pipe, but you can actually go ahead and work with objects. And the fact that it's cross-platform, that alone, I think, is, sort of makes it stand out uh, against, against other platforms. I, I, will, I will preface right at the start sort of to, to sort of also indicate that there's some things that are not so great about PowerShell. Uh, and, I, and I wanted to sort of put those out right at the beginning. First of all, I think the syntax has something to be designed, desired. So, for example, if I want to go ahead and say, you know, is uh, Inigo, we can go ahead and do dot, uh, dot length. That's going to turn the length because it's the dot net object. So I can go ahead and return the, that, that data about it. And then I can go and say, well, does it equal, you know, six? Uh, but it turns out that you can't say equals like that. You have to go ahead and do it in a much more native uh, operations. You have to go say, is it equal to that? And sort of all the, dot, the, 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 um, all the different expressions you might want to write uh, are all available to you. Again, that was a control space. You can go do things like C or uh, match or case incentive match, or you can do regular expressions. All of those are available to you. But the way that that is, is done is not through an operator that we traditionally think of, but rather through um, uh, a dash and then specify what you do. So it is, it's, it's kind of cool in the sense you can go, you know, dash uh, equals, and that'll go ahead and return, hey, in this case, it's not, it's not six, obviously it's not, uh, and we can go ahead and get that data back. But there, it's a pretty powerful thing in the sense that we can do regular expressions right on the command line. By the way, to get back to your previous command is the up arrow. So I can go ahead and do this, and you go, and then do a, a dat match, and then I can go write a regular expression to sort of say i dot star, uh, and it'll go ahead and sort of do regular expressions, say, hey, yeah, that's true. We can go ahead and do regular expressions right in the command line related to that. And then if I want to actually get the data coming back, I can type matches, and, and I can go and tell me what the match is coming back. In this case, I had no parentheses. wasn't particularly interesting, but we could go ahead and make that more complex. So I could go ahead and do something like this. Uh, and then get matches again, uh, and we can go and start to see how we can sort of build and work and interact with regular expressions. Or if I want to go to a name, you know, same same kind of thing. We can do a question mark first better. And in this case, I'm going to do two commands on the same line, so you can separate your commands with semicolon. So I can do dollar matches here. And, and it'll come back and tell me, OK, we did the parse. We got a variable back, and we got a first letter. And then, of course, because match is in an object, I can go ahead and work with it, interact with it like it's an object, so I can say first letter. And it'll go ahead and just give me back the first letter, the first command executed up here. That was the first command. And then I got, so I got two results back. And then I can actually go put that in expression. So I can say, if this works out, if that actually was true, then let's go ahead and print out the results. So in this case, I'm just getting the first letter out. And I'm starting to interact with the turn coming from that expression uh, to go and get the, the first letter. And we're starting to see on the fly, I'm starting to build up um, um, sort of some code that's, that's starting right here. 
questions, comments, thoughts about that? Um, the other thing that's interesting is I can, it, when I talked about sort of things, there's some things that are more difficult, is I can go ahead and do things like this, and I could do things like first let, like we pretend that exists, and I don't get an error. And, and I think that's somewhat unfortunate because of the fact that I mistyped this, I think the value is null, in actual fact, I mistyped the name. And so it's forgiveness is somebody sometimes problematic because you think you did a great job, you typed perfectly, and it turns out you just made a mistake, you mistyped something, and, and it doesn't go ahead and throw an error. And that can be a, a significant issue is that it's sometimes just too forgiving. Another place where you might do this is I can go do something like this. Let me do a, another collection here. We'll do one to you know, 10. And then th this is, we'll, we'll assign this to a variable. So dollar data equals. And then I can also, uh, whoops. And then I can do dollar data dot count um, to go ahead and give me the number back. But it, it, it sometimes it'll be very, it, it won't sort of tell you that you didn't actually get a collection that you expected. So sometimes you'll dot, dot count and it'll automatically before you go, well, when assigning to data, there's not actually more than one item. So let me not make a connection. Let me sort of decompose it out of the collection and just treat it as one item. And you'll do a dot count and it'll fail because the count method doesn't exist because it was trying to be nice and helpful for you and interpret the idea that you had only one item, so no reason to deal with it as a collection. Kevin. Details. Thank you. That explains why the answer was zero and not, 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 not 10. And um, by the way, Kevin's dangerously close to having to do in the next talk at this point. <laughs> um, OK. So some other things just fundamentally that you should help be helpful to understand. We talked about the fact that there's operators, and I showed sort of one way to go get those operators to, is to go do that. Uh, it, one of the nice things here is there's a like expression. So instead of having to know things like regular expressions, which are a pain, uh, I'm not going to do like on a non-string. That would be silly. Uh, you can do, let's say, not like. And then here we can go ahead and specify um, know, star O, and, and let's go ahead and, and do a not like expression related to that. So we can, again, you don't have to do regular expressions. There's much more simple ways to interact. So the question was, are there any known issues or concerns when uh, PowerShell and M1 Mac? Well, besides the fact that you're running a Mac, I can't come up with anything. That, that's probably the biggest the biggest reason I'd be concerned. Uh, you do have to install it, but other than that, it, it works great. Yeah. Uh, Reese. Yeah, thank you. So Reese pointed out that I actually have a discrepancy here. Sometimes I go ahead and wrap things in, uh, in double quotes, and sometimes I wrap them in single quotes. It's actually a really important point, so let me talk about that. It turns out you can do string interpolation. So we'll go ahead and assign a value variable, dollar name, E uh, equals inigo, but first we'll change back to US keyboard. And then we can go ahead and do, uh, let's do a last name, dollar last name equals Montoya. And then we can do dollar first name equals dollar name. And then we can do dollar name equals, and here I'm going to use double quotes, I'm going to go ahead and say first name, dollar first name, uh, space, dollar last, uh, I'm using the space name, the, the control space to go get the, uh, the IntelliSense to fill in there, and because I've done it in double quotes, you'll notice that it goes, oops, so you won't notice because I didn't print it out, do that again, um, you'll notice that it just goes ahead and handles the, the concatenation for you, uh, and does string interpolation, so I can embed those variables within within the within the double quotes. If I change that to use single quotes, then it goes ahead and doesn't do the string interpolation, and I literally just spit out whatever I had in the string. So generally speaking, this isn't always the case, but if you're going to work with regular expressions that have lots of interesting syntax, it's frequently a good idea to go ahead and just use single single uh, quotes. And yes, of course, you're doing substitution inside 
your regular inspection, in which case you want string interpolation to do that. Since I was doing relatively simple regular inspections, uh, it's hard to become simpler than that. I went ahead and used single quotes rather than double quotes. Great, important distinction. Uh, just from a guideline perspective, if you don't need string interpolation, use single quotes. And whenever you need uh, string interpolation, use double quotes, but default to single unless, unless you actually need a string interpolation to occur. Kevin. So the question was around uh, naming of functions, and we'll get to that. I'm going to hold off in a little bit before we, we, discuss that, we discuss that topic. Any other questions with things we've covered so far? There's a problem. So it tells you that. No. So the question was, hey, there, uh, it, does it always not tell you when there's a problem? And the answer is absolutely not. So if you're working with uh, an object, so let's do something like, uh, You know, if you're trying to call it on a member like that, that's not going to occur. That's not, that you're going to, you better call members that don't exist. Uh, there are times, however, where you'll go ahead and try to access a property that doesn't, that doesn't exist. It'll give you an error and say that property isn't available. It's usually in situations like accessing hash tables where the, the data isn't available and scenarios like that. The other point is you can, you can still do things like throw. Uh, so you can throw to go ahead and report an error. So if you call the function that did a throw, you're going to get exception coming out. And the throw is kind of interesting here because I don't actually do a need to do a new instantiation uh, of a .NET type. I can just say an error occurred. And it'll go ahead and report the error and just report the, report the text back. So you have the ability to throw and try and catch uh, and, and that kind of syntax. And obviously, there's times where you'll call functions that do that, or you'll call a .NET function that throws an exception. You're going to get the data back. The data back. Um, so other questions so far? I want to talk a little bit about what to do on the other side of the pipe. So often we're going to go ahead and have syntax. So we'll go ahead and have this do a, a, a collection. We won't do it to infinity. We'll do it to 10. So we'll just specify a range here. I'm going to pipe it across. And you'll notice on the other side, I just want to go ahead and print out this, this information. So I'm going to do a for each. And then I'm going to go specify a variable here. And the variable is essentially the, it the, the item that is set as you iterate over the collection of items. So in this case, on the left-hand side, I have a collection of items 1 through 10. Uh, and then I'm doing a for each of those. And then I'm saying, after you've done inside for each of those objects, go ahead and print out the value that's coming over the, over the pipe. In this case, it's going to be uh, a dollar underscore. We can use to do, just to make sure you understand, this is a string. This is a object. Uh, I can do something like that, but I got an error. What did I do? Uh, I have no idea why I keep doing square braces, but you know, whatever. So now I've gone ahead and printed out all those uh, items on this command line. You can see that that's, that's available to you. So uh, you can iterate over every single object and then start performing multiple operations on this. So in this case, I did a two string. I could actually save a variable to the beginning. I could go and say dollar total equals zero. And then I can go ahead and say, dollar total plus dollar underscore. And at the end, I could go ahead and print out dollar total. So um, it didn't print out the total. What did I do wrong? Oh, I didn't set it equal, so that's not very helpful. So there you can go ahead and do the to totally up the object. Uh, you'll notice that when you do the operator equal, if you're assi doing assignment, there are operators like, like plus equals to do, to do assignment. There's just not comparison operators without using a dash, uh, the dash type syntax for those for each of that. Um, that whenever there is a return, that is going to escape out of the pipe. And so in this case, because I did total plus, there was a return from the plus operation, the uh, plus operation. So it took that and said and signed it out and just spat it out of the out of the pipe. And I got more, uh, I got you know ten of the items because those were all re goal returned. Since total of the time was zero, they all returned to get to get that data back. Uh, what's really interesting about that is that it, it can turn to bite you. And this is another place. I think this is probably the, one of the first guidelines I'd give specifically is when you declare your variables. If you don't go ahead and declare a variable uh, and 
uh, specify that it's equal to something, it actually ends up in your pipe. And that's very, very dangerous. So whenever you declare variables, you always want to go ahead and assign them something. Otherwise, it will take that variable and throw it into the pipe and will pop out on the other side in ways that are very unexpected and can be very confusing. So one of the, one of the guidelines, and, I, and this is a, this is a like always guideline, is always go ahead and assign your guidelines, your variables initial value. Otherwise, what you're essentially doing is take the total and put it into the pipe and send it across the wire. And, I mean, send it across the pipe. And you don't want that, that to happen. So you always want to assign your variables. You can also go ahead and um, give your variables data types. And there are a few keywords for data types. In this case, I'm going to go ahead and declare it an int. So I'm initializing it and I'm specifying the data type. Because PowerShell is fairly loosey about, you know, typing and things like that. I, I have a best practice. I wouldn't say you always do this, but you're pretty close to always, is I would always specify the data type when you're declaring a variable so that it doesn't end up being something you're surprised by. Uh, and so one of, the, one of the things I do is number one, always assign, your, uh, always assign your variables when you declare them. And secondly, always make sure you specify the data type uh, as much as you can. If the, if the data type's really complicated, really long, then sometimes you, you might want to not do that. But, but for the most part, that's a really helpful, helpful thing to do. So we've talked about the fact you can do for each. I can iterate over, over collection. You can also do things like where. So we can go ahead and let's just go ahead and put data. Data will declare as an int array. And we'll go ahead and assign this 1 through, yeah, 1 through 42, because what other number would you use? And then we'll go ahead and say data. And here we're, we'll go ahead and pipe this across. And instead of saying for each, we're going to go ahead and say where object and here we're going to say let's go ahead and do it whenever um dollar dollar underscore mod i don't know if that works mod two uh dash equals zero So we're only going to go ahead and get the collection coming out, that they're all even. That was the expression that I went to execute it. So now we can do, in a similar way, you can do link. You can do, you can do for each, iterate each, over each of the objects. You also can do a where to sort of filter the items down that sort of match the criteria you, you want, to, want to try to work with. Now, uh, for, there's also, there's a whole bunch of, of objects that you can do. So you can do star uh, dash object. And you'll notice there are a whole bunch of commands. I'm just going to pair through them. So you can measure object, extra object. And so there's this whole idea um, of, of being able to do things with objects, but the expressions that are frequently used at the beginning are sort of your where and your for each to sort of filter criteria. When you're on the command line, just hold for a second. When you're on the command line, there are abbreviations. Well, there are abbreviations always, but you can also change this syntax to just be a question. Uh, not that one. You can change this syntax to just be a question mark. So instead of having to type where object every time, you can just use a question mark, and it'll abbreviate that where object to be to be a shortcut. You can just use the question mark, so it's a much much shorter. And similarly, you can actually abbreviate the for for each uh, case, and you can just abbreviate that to be a percent. Uh, and so that's a uh, I used the wrong one, but yeah. So you can do the same thing. You just do percent, and it'll go ahead and give the results for that one. Um, so some shortcuts, you can use the question mark, and you can use the percent to say for each or use, or use a where clause. You can also do things like select. So if we go ahead and take our data, and uh, we want to, instead of passing back, uh, instead of passing back the, I'm trying to think what I can do with integers. It's not very interesting. But um, I can pipe this into a select object. And here, I can go ahead and do a transformation in the same way that you do with the select with links. So we can do a transformation. Let's just go ahead and transform this into be dollar underscore dot two string. And let's go ahead and do uh, dot get type. So now we're going to go ahead and transformation. We're going to first call dot two string, then we call dot type. So we should get a whole bunch of strings coming out. Uh, and we'll actually not just spit this out. We'll actually just measure this. And so now it's going to say, hey, there's 42 items, and it's just going to measure back and give us a count for, for what, was, what was coming back. We didn't actually get the type, but in this case, we could also put something in front of it. So here we could say um, where dollar underscore dot, no, dollar 
type where dollar underscore dot name. So we're getting the type and we're asking for the name is equal to string. I think it's system.string, so I'm trying, trying this, we'll see what happens. And so we got to come back at zero because the actual name of that variable is going to be system.string. So the data type is system.string. Oops, we still didn't get back. System.string. Let's find out what it is. Okay, we did select object, two string, get type, and then we did for each print out the name, which is system.string. So somewhere I just type something. The statement is, oh, wait a second, your two string is capitalized. So PowerShell is not case sensitive. Uh, you can make expressions be case sensitive, but it doesn't matter what case is case sensitive. In the vast majority of cases, um, there's some corner cases where it behaves weirdly, but for the most part, PowerShell is not case sensitive. The operations you can um, About typing? Yeah, great. Okay. Um, so what actually, I, I did like what you were doing. Where it was like oh, I didn't put a dollar, so that doesn't count. It, it errors out, but you have to type it correctly. So the question was, uh, when you go ahead and do declaration, will it go ahead and do type checking for you? And and as you can see, it's going to go and say, hey, I can't convert one text to another. Ah, so now if I tell, so first of all, I couldn't declare it. But let's, so the question was, what if I go ahead, obviously, if I go do text and assign it uh, something here? So it's still not going to allow it. <laughs> okay, so uh, it turns out that it has a very, very flexible casting mechanism. And so when you go ahead, it has this equivalent idea that you can go ahead and just do this cast. In this case, it's casting that to an int, and it has no, no problem casting a string to an int because that is obviously zero. Just the same why it can do something like that. Right? And in fact, just to understand how loose this is, I can do that. Remember, text is, isn't it. It's not. <laughs> this is really confusing code. Let's redeclare text just to make sure we're clear. Text. Uh, we'll go ahead and make this a number. So it it has a very very strong ability to coercion, and and the reason for this is because they're trying to help you fall into doing the right thing. As somebody who spent way too much time programming in PowerShell. I actually think it ends up resulting in you having very confusing and surprising results when you don't expect them. I'd much prefer that an error occurred. But it has this idea of coercion that if it can coerce the type into what you expected it to be, it will do so. And so in this case, rather than you having to go ahead and call, you know, parse or something like that, it just does the coercion for you and handles that handles that conversion. So in the case of, of an empty string, it is also coercing that and going, well, presumably you meant zero, so we'll just go with that. Uh, I, I think this is very dangerous. In fact, I would actually argue this is one of the one of the things that detract PowerShell from being easy to program and easy to work with. Uh, so there is a way to do strong. I, I don't remember. So when you're scripting, there's a way to say. Uh, I don't remember this. So the question was: Is there a way to go ahead and have this be? Uh, more strongly typed uh, and not do that coercion. And, and I think there is, I just can't remember the syntax, um, 
Let me see if I can find a, an example of this. So you can go ahead and turn strict strict mode in, but I don't think it sufficiently handles what, what you're looking to do. I, I can't I can only do that on a file, and I still don't think when you check strict mode, I think that what that handles is making sure if that a language has changed it, it goes with the most recent version of the language. I don't think it forces you to be strongly typed. So as as far as I recall, there is not a way to force to prevent the coercion that it's making. Any other questions before I go on? So, so, so more, more importantly, uh, before we, before we uh, uh, badmouth it too much, the, the statement was, so uh, PowerShell is TypeScript. Uh, what I'm really going to take out of this is to say PowerShell is script. And, and it is absolutely, actually, is script. And, and I don't want to badmouth it too much by calling it JavaScript, but I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but it, it does have the same qualities of JavaScript. It has slightly more time spent engineering JavaScript. Recent versions of JavaScript are obviously better. But, um, but it definitely is a scripting language, which allows you to do, uh, which which allows you the feel and the 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 type safety that comes along with the scripting scripting language, and that has both good good and bad about it. I mean, for example, uh, you know, in, at the extreme, if you're writing unit tests and you want to go ahead and 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 put a mock in for a function, that's very easy to go ahead and change behavior even on an object. You can go change the behavior on an object that's already there because you can go ahead and inject code and change change that behavior so you can easily mock something out. And that's a really, really powerful concept that turns out in C sharp or a strongly typed language is a lot harder uh, to work with and, and makes testing in many cases uh, easier for certain scenarios. So, uh, other questions before I go on? Um, so one of the things we did here is uh, you, you have the ability to go ahead and save all your commands. You can go ahead and save the history. So we can go ahead and look back and see what the history is. So one thing that's useful about this is I can now go get uh, you know, the fifth command here. Uh, and I can tab it out. I'll tell me this is the command, fifth command that I went ahead and, ahead and ran. Uh, I, I don't want to spit out my. Uh, so we can go sort of say 82 and tab. And it'll go ahead and pull back uh, the 82nd command, as you can see, right in there. Uh, and so that's a useful thing to know is you want to go back and look at your history. You can go do that. But you don't actually have to do that. You could just go like this, version. And then do that, and it'll go ahead and, and iterate through all the commands you have previously executed. Uh, and uh, what's really powerful is, yeah, so the only restriction about that is if you close down the shell and reopen it, you can go ahead and use the up arrow to cycle through previous history, even after this, the shell is closed. What you can't do is use the pound uh, to navigate through previous history that way. You have to use the arrows to up, to up arrow to get it. Um, there is a way to program it to do that. You can extend your, your profile to do that, but it's not out of the box. Bruce. So the question was, are they stored in a .history file in, in Bash? Um, I don't know exactly where they're stored, but you can get them by typing uh, history or get history. So if you want to go see them, and there's a true alias for that is just H to go and get, get them back. Um, I don't know what the back end storage, storage mechanism because I all get history and I have them all, it didn't, didn't really matter to me. Other questions? What did I do with the pound sign? So with pound, you can recall any commands. So you can type in a previous thing you've typed and just push tab and it'll go ahead and allow you to tab through those. So if we did a, um, let's do something with text. So dollar text, and I can tab through that and it'll go ahead and all the things that actually contain text and I can pull that up. So that I, I really, I mean, you rarely have to, you rarely have to retype the same command over. If it's recent, you can just type up. But if you wrote a really complicated command, you can just do pound. And you know, I think what do we start with? Uh, we started with data. So I can just tab, tab through everything that contained data. I'll go ahead and pull up and let me tab through it and get access to that. Um, and if you want a specific number, I could just keep using a specific number, say 82, uh, and hit enter. Uh, sorry, 82, and then hit tab. And it'll go ahead and pull up that command every time so it can re execute it over and again or edit it. Or edit it. Other questions? How are we doing in terms of speed, content, fast enough, slow enough? This, is this helpful? Um, how many people have not yet learned anything? Remember, I'm trying to keep tabs, make sure we got somebody to speak next time. So I suspect somebody, some, people, some of you are lying, but that's OK. We'll, we'll, we'll let it slide this time. <laughs>
is there a shortcut for so um, well you can use select without specifying curly braces so one second I got a I got a problem with my prompt right now that I need to figure out so function I was going to show this guys later so function prompt Sorry, we had an error going on there. I'm not sure what it was, but um, the question was, is there, so what you can do is if I can go ahead and select, uh, let's go ahead and do um, string dot, string dot, I did the T cup uppercase. That bothered somebody before. I would hate to do it twice. String dot get type dot get member members. Uh, so you notice I get a whole bunch of data back here. Let's go ahead and spit that out slightly differently. We'll go ahead and put it into a format. Uh, select, we'll select the first one. Uh, okay. I understand. <laughs> I was wondering why you were there. I was like, isn't that your job, not mine? <laughs> okay, so here I can do select, select first, first uh, two, and it'll go ahead and give me back just the first two objects. Um, and you'll notice uh, I can then go ahead and say, let's do that same thing, but let's go ahead and just select the name. But instead of going ahead and using select, I can just do name. And it'll come back and just give me the, the, the name of the first two items in my list. Or if I don't filter the list out, You can do that, but I don't think that's answering your actual question. Let me repeat the question. The question was, is there a shortcut for um, select object just like there is for where and for each? And the answer is no, except if you use for each, you can pretty much do a select in many cases. So when you iterate over the for each, it's the same syntax. So here in this case, I selected just the name, but I could do the same thing with, uh, I am doing the same thing. This so. Let me explain. You can do select dash object. And then in here, you can specify just certain properties to go ahead and get back out. So I can say dash expand property, and then I can do name. And it's going to go ahead and select the name. But that's the same thing as doing a for each. And getting just the name, I'm getting the same results back. So, select is more frequently used for filtering, or uh, not for filtering. Um, yes, it's for filtering for things like uniqueness, or the first set of items, or the last set of items. So, it's filtering based on the quantity usually. Uh, but unlike with the where, where it's actually filtering on criteria, you can go and do select, but actually coming back and giving you the so select dash object and then here you'll notice it's got things like unique so I can go ahead and filter the unique or I can say dot first and I'll go ahead and give me the first and I'll specify the number you know first four items or I can go ahead and say last yeah so the, I, I showed an example earlier let's put it up um, dollar property whoops pound property so here we did an expand property, we're just selecting sing, a single object, or you can go ahead and do property and then specify you want multiple. So if we want to get name, what are we getting members? Uh, the return type. Bank. Okay, fine. Right, right. So in the select case, you could go ahead and filter either horizontally or vertically without specifying criteria. And that's true. You can, of course, do that in a for each loop because you just go ahead and select the two properties you want to go ahead and return. So there's a lot of overlap between those two. I generally use for each unless I'm trying to filter the list by quantity or some number or just look at the first few. Um, or I, I do, I, I feels, feels right trying to select which members are available. That's a fairly common, uh, a common thing to do as well. So. I 
I've never really thought about when I use which. There's a lot of interchange there, but um, I, I don't know of a shortcut for 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 that. So um, So you'll notice that you can actually go ahead and iterate through the aliases to go see what what they are. And so I went into the alias uh, and said, "What are the aliases here?" And I said, "Get alias," and it tells me what the alias is on this environment. And you can set your own alias as well. So in this case, it's telling me, "Hey, these are the aliases available to me in this one." And if I want to go create additional ones, I can go set dash alias and say something like dc, and then I can point to where my beyond compare file is, uh, which I don't know. So I can do set dash alias DC. And then I can just type BC and I'll go ahead and open up that 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 thing, which I'm I guess I can do, but uh, so you can set an alias for the stuff that you're working with. Other questions? Or we'll keep going. Um, let's quickly look at, at creating a function. So uh, you can go ahead and declare functions. Again, I'm going to do this on the command line. Uh, so in this case, I went and created a BC, but it seemed like in order to do this, I wanted to find a file and then create an alias for the file that I found. So that seems like it'd be really useful if I know that there's something on my computer. I want to go ahead and create an alias rather than going to finding the path. And in this case, I used cut and paste. I felt kind of guilty using cut and paste. Like, why am I using cut and paste in the command shell? I use my mouse. It's against my religion. Uh, Kevin, go ahead. So it's a good question. Let's go ahead and say get process. Uh, one of the things you'll notice when I call get process is all uh, commands that are correctly written are singular, not plural. So when I say get process, it's going to give me back all the processes on the machine. There's not very many. It's not, it's not doing very much. Uh, and then he said we wanted to get the idea, ID. So in here, I could go ahead and say, give me back the ID was the, was the request. What was next? Oh, okay, so in this case, we're going to say, let's just go ahead and do a where uh, dollar underscore dot name. Uh, I'll make it a like t star, t star rather than filter because I don't know if anything called test in my in my list of. And then I want to go ahead and just select out the name. So there is all the processes that begin with. With T, I don't have any that start with test, so that would have been a bad, bad query to do. But you get the idea of how to, how to do that. Does that cover the question? Okay. Um, back to functions. So I went ahead and did something here where I, I first found a command, and, um, and then I went ahead and did a, um, and then I used my mouse to copy that, to copy that data. And I felt a little dirty doing that. I did it because I was, you know, wanted to just demonstrate that I can use my mouse. But what would be better is if I automatically said, well, let's go ahead and do this and let's have a way to set an alias for something that I was finding. So it's an XE. We want to go and find an XE. So in this case, I can say, well, in this function, uh, by the way, before I, before I go too much further, ES is a command line program called everything. And it searches your whole hard drive instantaneously. And so that's not a PowerShell specific thing. It's it's uh it's just a Windows program, and but I haven't uh so I can actually go ahead and say get dash command. Yes, and we can select the path. I don't know if this is gonna work. Nope, nice idea. There. So in this case, you'll notice I've installed the program. Uh, <laughs> getting really hairy. We're getting many different levels. There is a program out there called es.exe. And so I can use uh, es to go find everything. So I searched my hard drive pretty much instantaneously, found a file, had that name. But it would be nice if I had a way of creating an alias for any exe that I happen to think was on my hard drive. So in this case, we'll go ahead and do a function. So we'll go ahead and say function. Uh, and we'll go ahead and say uh, set um, exe alias to go ahead and set it. 
Um, the first thing you'll notice when we go ahead and write in this function is I've gone ahead and got a naming convention set up. The first part of it is a verb and then a noun. And generally, when you go in, when you want to write uh, PowerShell functions, you want to follow a convention. And the convention is that all your functions should have name dash noun. You can go ahead and provide aliases that are not following that convention. For example, um, you know, if I want to do a dir, I mean, let me just do this. If I want to do a dir, I can go ahead and see all the items in my directory or ls for those of you Linux folks or Mac folks. Um, and those are not actually the commands. Those are just aliases to the commands. But the actual command for something like uh, a list is get child item. So I can do uh, get dash alias ls. And you'll notice that that's actually a shortcut for get child item. Uh, and so a lot of the Linux commands, a lot of the, map of the Windows commands are mapped into aliases that point to functions that are written as part of the framework that included. So both dir and ls let's do that. So when I went into create my function, I'm following the naming convention that we're going to go ahead and have a verb and then a noun. It is actually more restrictive than that. that. The best, best practice is to make sure your verb is actually a member of the get verb uh, collection. So I can say get verb, is this a valid, a valid uh is this a valid verb to use? And so I can call get verb and do it. But it doesn't have things like get verb, uh, verb, dash, uh, let's think of one. It's easy to come up with ones that are not in the list when you're not, when you're not actually you know, speaking. Uh, let me think of this. Get dash verb uh, concat. That's not a valid verb. Right? And so you need to sort of, you try to sort of restrict. At, at worst, there's always the verb invoke. So you can always use invoke as a verb, and that'll go ahead and let you do stuff related to, oh, I'm calling something that I don't have a verb for that you can do. But as best as, best as possible, you try to limit it to the set of verbs that are approved. Uh, and the reason for that is it's a common convention, so we all get used to doing stuff. And so you can imagine there's a get, and then there's a set for, for, for most of the commands, things, things like that. So we went ahead and defined um, a function here called set alias. Um, inside here, we're going to go ahead and execute some code. So we'll go do an ES, and we'll go ahead and take a parameter. Uh, so my parameter is going to be a string for the name that we want to get in. So we're going to do a dollar name. And then we're going to do, uh, sorry, I should put that inside parens. So now we've gone ahead and declared a, um, a parameter. And then we'll do go ahead and do an ES for that name. And I'll go ahead and hit enter. So the set alias right now. Exe alias. We'll go ahead and pass in something like b compare, uh, and we should actually type it with just one without the extra s there. And so it's going to go ahead and run that command inside a function because we just created a function for that for that one command. Now in this case, we haven't helped ourselves because we got one command. We wrote three commands to do it, so we need to actually do something more. So let's go ahead and take that data. And let's go ahead and get this back as a result. Um, dollar path equals. Now it turns out, you'll notice in this case, I get two items back. Uh, and so I want to go ahead and make sure I only get the first item. We don't want to get them get a whole bunch. So we're just going to take the first item. So we're going to say pipe this. And we'll go select dash object uh, dash first one. We're going to go ahead and just get the first one. And then let's go ahead and print out the path, dollar path, so people can see what the result was. And now we can go ahead and run that, that function. So we get in the back the result. We've just gone ahead and program path here. And then the next thing we want to do is actually go ahead and call set dash alias. And we also need to get a the alias. We're going to set it to the path. And so now we need another parameter. Uh, let's put it right here. And we're good to go. So now I can do set dash exe alias. We're going to specify what the alias is. In this case, it's going to be b c, and then we're going to um, just do, uh, and then the, the command that we're looking for uh, is v comp exe. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and set an alias. So now in theory, we have an alias called b comp. Theory. Did I mention the in theory part? Oh, sorry. There's a, there's a thing going on here. We actually need to set the scope. Uh, 
No, what? Sorry, what's that? No. Oh, maybe not. That's a good point. Thank you. So I changed the function, but I didn't run it. So it had an extra gun to set my alias. Thank you for the help. That's, that's appreciated. I knew there's a reason I had an audience. Couldn't figure out what it was, but now I got now I know. Okay. Um, so this is a really common thing where you, there's a lot of times you do something, you do something twice, you're like, oh, that's it. I'm not doing it another more time. Another time, and you go ahead and quickly throw a function together and, and start to work with it. Of course, now if I do this and I go and start another session inside my Windows terminal, that function is not going to be available. So set dash uh, exe, you'll notice there's no tab, there's something else going on there. There's no tab for that uh, get dash command set dash exe star. There's no command for set uh, exe alias. That's not available. So we want to make this available inside other environments. And the way to do that is to open up your profile. So I'm going to go ahead and do code dollar profile. And the profile variable here, dollar profile, um, it maps to a, a specific path within your user drive that you can go ahead and then start modifying. And so you can put functions in here that allow you to go and actually work with, um, to work with your profile. We are out of time. I don't, we, I don't know what we should do. So question? So the question was, when you did the process stuff, so pound process, um, and we want to go ahead and select out more than one property. So here we select all the ones that are, that are um, begin with T, and we can do that fairly easy. So we're going to pipe this. Sorry. Just go percent ID common name. Um, but there was a way to do it the way I did it, which is maybe. Um, OK. So select object is the way I would do it. ID common name. Uh, you can also specify it. It's defaulting to a property here. Property. Go do that. It's the same thing. It's just defaulting to the, the first parameter, the first parameter in the function. Any other questions? Benjamin. So dollar profile is not a key. It's not a res so the question was, are there other reserved keywords that you can use? So it turns out the dollar profile is not a keyword, it's just a variable. So there's a whole bunch of variables that are just built in. For example, you can do environment. Uh, and or dollar env v colon computer name. Uh, sorry, uh, let me do this. So get you call get variable. It's going to tell all the variables that are available on your machine. So like there's a dollar ps home. That's your home directory, your PowerShell home directory. So um, there are a whole bunch of variables, and they're all available by calling get variable. And so I wasn't actually calling a keyword. It's just a variable in the computer, just like data that we declared earlier was. By the way, you can also, this is really interesting. There's what's called PowerShell drives. You can actually CD into these locations. So I can do CD uh, variable. And now I'm actually in a variable uh, drive for all my variables. And you can actually go ahead and, and sort of uh, so you'll notice all these are just variables that are inside the drive. I can, I can actually CD into a registry. You can't do this on Windows. I mean, outside of Windows, I don't think. Uh, H key local machine. And now you'll notice I'm inside my registry, and I can actually go iterate and work inside my registry. I can do this also with my aliases. So CD alias. And there's all the aliases that I've got set up uh, in my environment. Uh, so you can actually do get dash ps drive. And there's a whole bunch of these that you can actually go iterate through and inter interact with. Um, the same is true with your environment variables. So you can go cd env colon, and you can actually start interacting with all your environment variables in the same way. These are all just items. And remember, each item is just a, is just a get item. And you can interact within whatever drive you're in. You're just calling get items to go look at individual items, interact with them. 
in that way. So there's what's called PowerShell drives. We, IntelliTech has written um, uh, one where you can actually CD into remote, uh, remote locations, like CD into one drive. We wrote one where you can CD into Dropbox. So you can CD into a Dropbox location just to do it as though you're, it's on your local machine, even though it's actually making network calls so we can interact with those files, because we just create um, a virtual drive inside PowerShell that allows us to interact with those items. Um, we are out of time. So rather than going ahead and opening up um, uh, VS Code and starting to get a bunch more uh, functions and that kind of stuff, this is, we're gonna, we're gonna end, it, end it right here. Um, I would like to hear sort of questions of stuff. Since we did have so many people that didn't learn anything, um, if you guys can go ahead and give some questions that we can sort of pin send to them for what they're going to present on when we do the presentation. Uh, any questions that like, oh, we really need to focus on this. What would be next if we did PowerShell? Um, any questions? Bill. Writing a PowerShell module. So yeah, that's a, that's a big one. It's definitely on the list. We need to talk about how to, how to write PowerShell modules. Uh, it's a really important part about actually extending PowerShell and, and doing that correctly is you can easily fall into doing the wrong thing and PowerShell is the way to do it right. And so there's lots of um, best practices around PowerShell. What else? Reese. Yeah, so there, it is actually possible to declare a, ca a class in PowerShell. Um, so that's absolutely the case. And and um, we, yeah, so we can talk about how to do classes and you can add objects, you can add methods and properties and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so that, that's a pretty common occurrence. What else? Okay, so there's there's a question about, hey, how do I work with, with flat files like JSON or, or XML or CSV? Uh, we can talk about actually translating those into, into objects. It's actually very interesting because you can take things like JSON and convert it into a .NET object and instantaneously you can deserialize it into an object and then actually interact with it like it has a property and has values and stuff like that. So that's, that's pretty cool interaction how to do that. Other stuff? Okay, worthwhile. This is the first time we've actually done a brown bag in at least you know two years more. I'm sorry, is this helpful? Was this interesting? Who says this was too basic? I'd be curious to know. Were we at the right level? We started from the beginning. This was this was okay. Okay. And and <laughs> the most important thing is we want to find out if we got Joseph to sort of favor PowerShell instead of Python. That was the goal. And <laughs> um, there was one question somebody asked that I didn't get to uh, um, was can, uh, when do you use C sharp versus PowerShell? And and I want to be very clear about this as somebody that knows C-sharp pretty well and knows PowerShell pretty well. Um, when you start to get sort of beyond the, the 500 to 1,000 lines per PowerShell, you're in the wrong language. Like it's just, there's just no doubt about it. And, and many times I started in PowerShell because it was just on the command line. I started just writing a function and then I added a function and then I refactored it. And then I was like, okay, I should jump into a file. So then I threw it into a file and sort of work inside a file. And I was still in PowerShell and I'm like, oh, this should really be a module. And suddenly I was programming in a module. And lo and behold, you know, after like three, three or four hours, I suddenly had like three or four hundred lines of code. I'm like, oh my goodness, this is way like as soon as you get into a world where you started to type lots and you're not getting compile time check in, you have to do test uh, test driven development. Those are places where I sort of say, hey, if you're starting to do enterprise level development, PowerShell is probably not the place to do that. You should probably switch to something that's compiled or something that's that's more enterprise ish like Python. Um, that that that's uh, probably a better platform to go. But if you're trying to do quick and dirty and go, that's that's worthwhile. The thing that's interesting is you can do C sharp in the command line. So there's actually a version of C sharp for the command line. So if I do uh, es escsi dot exe, wow, there's a lot. So here is a command for uh, for for C sharp in the command line. So I can actually run this run this version of C sharp in the command line. And now I'm inside C sharp in the command line. And now I can go ahead and do like um, console dot write console dot write line. Test. And it'll go ahead and print it out. But you'll notice I can't do things like this. 
because it's case sensitive. I'm now in C sharp. And the same command would work if I exit out of here, which is control C, which is lame. And now I do the same command in PowerShell. I think I'm PowerShell. I'm I'm in PowerShell. Okay, so here I gotta do sys uh no oh no, sorry. This is uh this is static. So now in PowerShell I can go do the same command, uh, but I am no longer case sensitive, and so you can do C sharp and PowerShell on the command line. I I Again, as somebody who loves C sharp, I find using a, a case sensitive language on the command line uh, production prohibitive. Uh, and I, I really love the fact that C sharp is case sensitive when I'm programming inside the IDE and I'm, I'm writing a full blown program. I find having case sensitivity uh, on the command line uh, prohibitive to production, and, and that just becomes more difficult to work with. You know, each their own, but, but that, that's been my experience. Uh, that said, with things like top level statements that are coming in C sharp and stuff like that, we're starting to get in a C sharp world that's much more, allows you to do a lot more scripting. So as, lo as long as you can get over the case uh, sensitivity that comes with C sharp, doing stuff in the command line is pretty powerful. Casey. So the question is, is with C sharp scripting, is it still compiled or is more than REPL? So the answer is both. It is definitely uh, a REPL because you can see I'm doing stuff on the command line, but ultimately it has to be compiled to IL. Um, so yeah, it's 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 a somewhat of both. Okay, Should we do this again. Yeah, this is helpful. Okay, thanks everyone. Sorry, we ran a little bit over there. Uh, if you have any questions, you can email me. Just my email address, Mark at Intellitech. That's it. Thanks. Am I off stage, Kevin? No, but don't say anything about the audience right now. <laughs>